for amazing panels tonight. If you guys want to come on up, Juliana, Jason, Sarah, and Garrett. Um, and hopefully you're all here tonight because you care about employer branding. Um, I'm curious, just to get a sense of the audience, um, how many people here are internal recruiters at their company? Okay, so just two people. Okay. How many people are um, external recruiters? So you're working with companies to help them pay one. Okay. Um, how many people are on the learning and development side? Sorry. Okay, what does everybody else do? <laughs> <laughs> I want a shout out, would you? Just curious. Just curious, okay. Communications. Communications, okay, so like the marketing and communication side of things. Real estate. Real estate, okay. So how many people have HR is something that they do, but it's not the only thing that they do? But they end up kind of doing it by default. One person, okay. <laughs> All right, so hopefully we'll spend some more time getting to know each other and understanding. <laughs> and if you're only here because we have Pellegrino, that's great too. <laughs> so that's often why I hang around at night for <laughs> general assembly. Um, so um, if we could start out with um, all of you just introducing yourselves, what you do in your organization, kind of where you fit into those sort of questions I was asking the audience. Um, and then if you could also talk about a company that you think does a really good job with employer branding, um, but it's not your company. So somebody that you, that you don't represent in your dream job or something like that. So Juliana, do you want to start? I'm Juliana Casale. I'm Director of Marketing at Referral Mob. And we are a hiring network, so we help companies find great candidates and candidates find great companies. So it's kind of like the matchmaker in the middle. Um, I joined as the fourth team member about six months ago. I had to hire two people after that, so I was new, trying to onboard new people. So I kind of had to build structure where there really wasn't very much, because um, it was just our CTO and our CEO, and neither of them could be bothered to kind of think about the long-term strategy of how we were hiring or how we could kind of build the culture. And you know, when you're a small company, sometimes that's not the first priority. Um, but I was very conscious of coming from mid-stage startups to a very early stage that this was the right level and stage to build it from scratch because you know you get to 30 people 60 people kind of it's too late by that point so um, yeah so I thought a lot about how we could attract the right candidates who we were looking for how we could kind of put together what our mission was and our values so um, I have a lot to talk about that um, and because we work with companies that are hiring I've attended a lot of employer branding workshops and things like that so excited to share my knowledge Oh, oh, and I skipped the question, sorry. Um, so Wistia is a local video platform. Um, they have amazing company culture and branding. They, uh, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to allow any staff member to blog on Tuesdays about something not related to video at all. So they share a cool recipe they just tried out or like a rock climbing expedition they went to in Patagonia, anything they wanted. And it just kind of showed the people behind the software. So I feel like a lot of companies, their software or product, they are kind of dry in the way that they can to their customers, but this really made you feel like you knew who was behind the scenes. They also have this wrap-up video they do every year where they wrap the past year in terms of growth and features and new staff members, and it's like a literal wrap. Um, and so it's just really cool to see, and you just see the comments, like it's hundreds of comments from people who are like, your team seems awesome, I really want to work there. So like they just do a really good job of like providing the enthusiasm of who works there and who they are as a company. Uh, my name is Jason Jones. I'm an employee branding specialist at Logging In. We're right down the street on Summer Street. We have two offices. Uh, we produce products such as LastPass or your password management uh, tool, uh, JoinMe, a web content tool. Uh, we recently completed a merger with a go-to student product. So that's GoToMeeting, GoToMyPC, GoToAssist. Those products are all under the Logging In uh, umbrella now. Um, I follow Cisco on Snapchat. Uh, for a really big tech company do a good job of showcasing their employees. So, so they allow their employees across the world, they sign up and they can say, you know, I want to showcase my office this day. And so today there was someone, I want to say they're in the Caribbean, so they were like showcasing their day at their office, giving back to like a local shelter, um, and do a kind of work. It's cool to kind of see who, who's behind the scenes of this big company. Um, do their Snapchat channel. There really aren't many rules, honestly. You would think for big companies, like you have to follow this guideline to say this and not say that. It's kind of boring, you know? They learn by doing. 
by, by feeling, so I'm expecting. Mm -hmm. My name is Sarah Wilkins. I'm the senior recruiter for talent acquisition at Dun & Bradstreet. And just a show of hands, has anybody heard of Dun & Bradstreet before? Okay, there's some pockets. That's all right. Um, we'll cover that in a little bit. Um, so I've been there for, well, about a year and a half. And what else am I saying? Oh, another company that I love? Mm -hmm. um, a company that I think does an amazing job of employee branding is a company that you've seen commercials for a million times, Sam Adams. And what's really unique about Sam Adams is when you compare their beer commercials against any other beer commercials like a Corona or a Bud Light or whatever, the Sam Adams commercials are always about employees first. So you always can see inside the, co the company, the culture, what they're doing, drinks on a roof deck, and you know with the Corona commercial, it's like a skinny model on the beach popping up here. You know, it's you don't get a sense of it, but um, I think they do an amazing job. They've been doing it since day one. Hi, I'm Garrett Boros. I am the product manager and the head of marketing at Tech Connection. Tech Connection is a um, tech company. We are a tech company which helps other underrepresented tech individuals find jobs, find tech jobs. It doesn't matter which industry is running these tech jobs. Um, one of the companies that we think that, that I believe um, actually very good and for brand name is HubSpot. Uh, there's a lot um, you can see about HubSpot and different, the way they um, different social channels. They show how it is to work there. They always put their employees first. It's very uh, fun to see what it is to, um, how it is to be there. It looks like there's a lot of fun to work there. Awesome. So hearing that, maybe some of you weren't even really sure what employer brand meant, but hearing what some of the panelists' ideas of companies that they respect what they're doing with employer branding, when you heard those examples, did anything come to mind of a company that you were like, oh wait, they actually are doing this and they're doing it well? Um, anything that, that pops into your heads? I'm gonna be asking you questions. Because <laughs> nobody's a pro on this. Like this term was coined probably what, like three years ago. And so none of us were experts. Anything come to mind? I think Google has just done that kind of over the years by working out, mm -hmm. kind of you know, what they give their employees and kind of services and perks for working in. So that's just one thing. I think everybody probably knows them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. With Google, also their interview strategy is something that people talk about a lot. If you hear about Google's interview strategy, and how does that even happen that we all know how they interview? Or it's like this whole, yeah, but it's almost part of their brand that it was exclusive but intelligent. Yeah. How about you? There's like the honey bunches of oats commercials, like your cereal and how it's made and the people that are doing it. Anybody remember this? Yeah, like the factory worker, yeah. and they're all like smiling yeah. and happy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is where all running on sugar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just picturing the bees. Is that the same brand? Oh, that's Cheerios. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that employer branding, I guess. Bad. That's another panel discussion. <laughs> so, um, Salesforce, they put a lot of pressure on a lot of companies because they did, Benioff put out the whole bid to go one plus one plus one so that you spend a portion of your time to make the action and that put a lot of pressure on the load. Oh, so they showcase what their um, individual employees were doing with their time. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. This might be a little controversial, but the American Petroleum Institute has like really cool, like flashy commercials and like it's really tailored to like millennials. And um, at the same time, it's kind of like fracking. So, <laughs> but it's like cool. Yeah, like they put a lot of they put a lot of effort into making it look cool. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing how much time and effort when you really start thinking about it. Like, right? How many are putting into this right now? Um, that's that's really great. So, I guess on like the the flip side, so we kind of know what looks good. Um, what, what do you think are some things, and I'm going to put this to the panel, what are some missteps or, or common misconceptions that companies have around what employer brand is or what is a good employer branding strategy? Anybody can jump in. Um, I think a big mistake or a misstep that a company can do 
is on your career page if you're just posting jobs and no sort of insight or like link to a peek inside the company, then forget it um, because you're just going to get lost. So I think when people are, I mean, they're going to be doing research. Um, so when you're they're going to your careers page and looking at the jobs, there's got to be some sort of link or inside pictures, anything, video to, uh, to what's going on inside the company. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't put a lot of effort into their job descriptions. It's like a free advertising for your company. That's your space to say why it's exciting to work there. And so many people just copy paste the template and just drop in the strategic words. The other thing is like the actual experience of interviewing at the company. You know, like some people don't get followed up with ever. Some people don't hear back and it's just like this dropped call or like a resume black hole or something. And it's like, that's a really easy way to differentiate yourself from all the other companies. Like how much do you respect your candidates or the people you're screening? So I feel like a lot of people think employer branding is just like the external right. communication of what your company looks like from the, the back side of it, but really like the experience someone has with your company is also what your employer brand is. And people talk, like if someone has a crappy experience interviewing with you, they're gonna tell other people. So like you should really be focusing on that as well. Like it's a really easy way to kind of invest some time and actually like impress people. Yeah, plus, uh, to just hop on that real quick, um, that's one of the things that you, I think companies don't realize that when somebody applies for a job there, there is a level of interest that they should kind of want to build on. And too many companies um, just allow that person to get a distasteful taste in their mouth about that company. And therefore, go back and tell their friends, as you said, how horrible that was. And there gives them a different outlook and what the company, that even if they love the, company, the product, just like how that company is, and people don't understand how much that turns people off mm -hmm. from even buying the products. Right, yeah, it's not just about the employee, it's about future customers too. That's interesting. Yeah. It's also about defining what employer branding means to your company, because to every company it's a bit different. Is it uh, advertising your job? Is it responding to glass door? Is it campus? Like, Every company perceives it differently, and depending who's in that role, if you're going to transfer that role, it's what do you think and what you're bringing into our company, and then A, let's you know figure it out, because I think you're wrong, or B, how do I tailor uh, your perception to what I want to do? Um, so I mean, like when I started, it's like, well, it's diversity, and then it's this, and then it's that, and it's events. It's like, well, I'm not Superman, I'm one person <laughs> by myself. So, you know, let's be realistic about what I can do. Employer branding isn't going to fill all your jobs. I'm not going to tweet or hire a software engineer, a bunch of software engineers are going to flock to the job. So, you know, let's be realistic about what I can do and the value I can add to the company. So, this isn't on the list of questions I sent you ahead of time. Oh, cool. <laughs> But you know, it, you mentioned an interesting point, like who do I work with? Well, I also work with my hiring managers, people that are actually doing, I'm helping to recruit for their specific open roles. And one of the things that I explained to them and the, the interview team is, you know, the response has to be quick and the experience, the interview experience has to be engaging for the candidate. Like you, as a candidate coming into my company down on Bradstreet and they're going to interview with five people, they can't, my five interviewers can't ask the same five questions, right? So it has to be like, um, they have to so, uh, focus on separate qualities for the candidate or certain, certain core competencies. So there's that piece of it too. But I also tell the hiring manager, we have to have a really good experience for the candidate because if we drag this out for like two, three weeks, that's we're gonna that's gonna suck. We're gonna lose them. So um, that's part of what I'm mm -hmm. helping for the employee uh, branding experience. Mm -hmm. So the hiring manager is definitely playing a role, yep. even though they might not realize it. Right. Uh, they're a huge part. Right. Anyone else who's kind of so I report to our director of talent acquisition, but um, our VP of HR has eyes on what I'm doing. Our chief people officer, he has eyes into what I'm doing. I'm with our recruiters, of course. I work with our HR business partners. I work with our creative team. Um, I work with our PR team. There are a lot of um, our, um, our web development team. So kind of dotted line, so a bunch of people, because without them, I would just be on an island between 
jobs. Exactly. No, no, I don't. Anybody else? Any other? I mean, when you work for a four-person company, everyone has an equal say because you're all going to be stuck on an island of desks all pushed together. If you don't like the person, that's a really big fail. So, well, I mean, I mean, that's basically my next question. I was going to ask you: Are right, you work for a small startup? Um, you've worked with for slightly larger startups as well. But what are some of, like if you are a small company or you're just starting your company? What are some like really easy ways that you can start building? money, um, that are scrappy. Yeah, so um, I would say like when I view employer branding, it's kind of a combination of the internal experience of being a staff member there, the external experience of interviewing there, or kind of um, being involved in some way with the company's output, whether it's social media, it's content, what have you, it's events that you attend that the company's involved in. And um, so it's kind of like, okay, internally, what can you do? You can put together like a mission statement so everyone kind of is aligned on what the purpose of the company is. So that way, when one of your staff members goes out to talk to people, you all kind of say the same thing. You have the same story. Um, so alignment, you can kind of set that ahead of time. Um, you know, you can use social media. That's a free way. You just set up an account on Instagram. You can show behind the scenes of the company. So that's something we did pretty um, soon after I joined. Um, you can uh, co-sponsor or sort of participate in panels like this. I mean, it's free for me to be here talking about you know my experience and what my company does. So that's something you can kind of just show your thought leadership in that way. You know, you're adding value to the ecosystem that you're in. Um, if you really get your um, your team members enthused about the mission or the customer, like they'll be good, be natural advocates for you. So they'll go out and say like, oh, I love working here. So it's kind of just fostering a sense of enthusiasm, and that's you know we have beer Fridays every Friday where we just get together and talk about our week and like it's 30 bucks a week and it's not that much money but it kind of just ties us together and gets us talking to each other so just like making sure you're checking in you're all aligned on your projects it's like you want to have this really good sense of community internally so that when you're out in the world talking about it people get a sense of like oh I'd really love to work there that sounds like a really fun team like a good purpose um, yeah so just like you know just as much as you can communicate of like what makes you different, what makes your people your people. Um, you know, so for example, I, I know we'll talk, talk about this later, but like if you ask your staff members like what makes a person at this company like fit in here, like what are the qualities that we look for that we look for that makes you succeed here, you know, you can turn that into a slide deck, a culture deck that you can put out on SlideShare for free. So, you know, it could be as simple as putting a PowerPoint with people's quotes about what they love working, like what made made them attractive to there I was really reluctant and I was like it's still a grad street it's a dusty old data company why do I want to work there my, my history is in advertising marketing and startups like ugh um, but what really kind of inspired me to, to work there and really um, move the pendulum is our CEO he gets it he comes from AOL um, he came in to shake things up and absolutely modernized on grad street he had to because how would how else would we based in Waltham now 
compete against the Logmians and the Nanavians and all the um, cool startups down here. Um, but he's done an amazing job. One of the things that he's done um, is, I'm raising hands, how many people are you familiar with the Muse? Okay, great. So we, we work with the Muse um, on a national level. And they've come in and they've done the video content for us and interviews and take pictures of our new office spaces. So that's been great. But also on a local level, there's a company called Venture Fizz. I'm not sure if y'all are familiar. Okay. So on a local level, they'll come in and do that for you too. If you just want a company, like a smaller company, uh, you know, more than that. So there's that piece. So you really, you know, if you go to the news and stuff, you can see our company from the inside out. We are interviewing, you know, some of the top leaders from the company, people that are hiring managers. You can kind of get a, a pulse on who they are, what I like to work for this person. Um, they're the ones that are doing all the interviews. But not, I mean, in, in so much of that, he really gets it as far as like, Knowing he needs, he knew he needs to modernize the company aesthetically and culturally. So it's a really great story to tell. How you know he's just so passionate about like making us a, an innovative company, a modern company, an agile company. Um, and we had a town hall today. And he said this, and I'm like, Bob, you just made my job ten times easier. He said he wants Southern Grad Street to be an amazing place to work for and do business with. And I'm like, yep, there you go. That's that's it. So. I know I'm leaving out a lot of pieces, but I don't want to. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, now you've created a monster I can talk to. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really helpful. And it's good to know like both the big names, like the views, but then also the local players. So if you're about, like, a Boston-based company and you're doing all your recruiting here, or something like VentureFizz, um, be, becoming friends with them. They write great content. Um, they're looking for like a lot of content, uh, content con contributors. So you can become a and then people find out about your company through reading the blog posts that you're writing. It's a great win-win. It's all free. Um, just a really excellent way to just plug into the Boston community. Um, I think Boston now also does all yeah. tours too. Um, so that's another one to follow. Um, so, um, so Jason, so Log Me In went through a major merger recently with the, the go-to product suite. Um, so that's obviously, has, it, has anybody's company's gone for a merger, or you're afraid they might be going through a merger, or <laughs> something that might be coming down the pike? Not so much? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe? Okay. Super fun. This question's for you. <laughs> well, no, it's more acquisition than yeah. merger. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> also super fun. Yeah. Well, I so that job too. Oh, okay. And it might be as simple as, you know, you're just hiring a, a bunch of people, like, all at once. So you're bringing in, like, this whole new identity, and you just need to make sure that you're keeping your, your brand identity co cohesive or just adjusting it accordingly. So um, like maybe you've never hired, um, you've always outsourced your development. And suddenly you're like, we're going to build a software team for our company. And so how do you make sure you build that team um, like with the brand that you want? For? So how have you guys thought about your your brands as you've done it? Yeah, so I've been in my role employee brain log me for about 10, 11 months. I've been with the company for three years. And so when I got promoted, um, a month or two later, it was like merger. So I was like, okay, um, can't really do my job right now. And you can do it in like bits and pieces, but you can't really like, you can't really like run these campaigns that you want to run and do X, Y, and Z and showcase X, Y, and Z because A, some of your employees may not be there at the merger or, you know, the brand may change. And so, um, it's really leveraging my like leadership. So I started as a sourcer, transitioned to tech recruiter, and then now employer brand. So people who are hired, I lean on heavy, very heavily. So um, I got photoshopped and I became employer branding uh, specialist. And so I, I hired a web designer year or two before. Hey John, you work with Photoshop? Can you show me some like you know tidbits on how you do X, Y, and Z? Um, leveraging those like relationships has allowed me to showcase people. You know, it's, it can be nerve wracking to be like, hey, Joe Schmo from um, uh, from the go to side. I don't know you. Can you do X, Y, and Z? I lean on people who I know. Once I win those, you know, the small wins, then I can branch out to someone who um, I don't know. And so, to go back to your question. It's like thinking on a bigger scale, but starting with people who I know. So once I can showcase to people I don't know, hey, this works here. I can do it on a bigger scale in more offices. Um, and it's. Did you feel like the go-to, um, did they have sort of like a different culture? Like, did you guys have to kind of like blend cultures at all? Or was yeah. it pretty similar? So, because they were under Citrix, um, another big company, a lot more process. 
where it logs me in and it's like bootstrap, you just do it. If you can't find the answer, you just do it or you find someone. And so, so what we're working through right now is there's not always a process or something, you just kind of do it. Um, like we're hosting a sales hiring over house in Tempe on Thursday. And one of our recruiters out there was like, hey, like, what's the cost for this one? He's like, oh, you just buy it, expensive. So I did. I'll take later. Yeah, you know, I buy it, I put it on my credit card, get some points, expensive, the money back, and you know, there we go. So, um, especially now that we're a bigger company, we will put more process to some things, but right now, three months from the, from the merging finalize, um, Kind of working between points, you know. You're gonna step in some landmines. You're gonna step in dog poop sometimes. <laughs> you know, it happens. You know, I'd rather uh, act now and after it was later than be like, hey, can I, can I, and then like never get anything done. Yeah. 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 Um, so, Gareth, um, what is very organic it has to first that company has to look at their pipeline so you need to expand their pipeline in terms of where they're looking not exactly who they're looking for the problem that most companies do is they look for the who than the where which is they oh we want to put we want more women in our company so you know what we're going to look for women you know we want you know to diversify our company a little bit more so they look for people with certain ethnic backgrounds and that that is a problem where that now becomes tokenizing. Mm -hmm. What you need to do now is, okay, where are we looking? Where, um, one of the things I even had a conversation just a few weeks before we started, which is um, most of the tech companies, which are really growing, are in the Northeast and West. You know, a whole bunch of schools in the South. Uh, to how many companies are looking outside to the Southern schools for computer science or for other talent? There are so many large schools out there. Mm -hmm. um, and by just taking those people and looking at those people there, um, adding them to your pipeline, you'll see how much how much of a diverse um, candidate pool you'll have. Mm -hmm. And you won't be able just to like be looking and say, oh my gosh, I'm looking for women, right? How many people look at you know schools outside? That's some of the things we need to look at that diversifies your pool. To start with the pipeline, and then let that get out your overall brand. Focus on your where, then your who, mm -hmm. um, and that that is the thing that you need to help with. To dovetail on that, um, I had the good fortune of today being our quarterly town hall, uh, which all the C level suite was speaking at, and so our chief people officer uh, actually happened to mention today that we are going to be launching a um, diversity inclusion website. So that people internally can tell their stories, and that way, hopefully, you know, when we post that on our website, it'll you know people will watch the stories and kind of be like, oh god, this company gets it, and, and be you know drawn to want to apply and be a part of our company. So mm -hmm. um, it's really it's, it's very very important. So yeah, and so encouraging employees to kind of share their stories exactly. like on their own volition and their own kind of will instead of kind of picking something. Like, hey, can we share this? Story? Well, it, and it's interesting too when you think about it, 175 years ago, as with most companies, they were all run by white males, right? So it's our commitment to represent the world's mosaic as a company now. And uh, we're, we're on our way. We're doing a really good job with it. Great. Yeah. Well, on the topic of sharing stories, uh, what do you do with Glassdoor? Oh, well, that's one of our questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get right to it, because that was one of the, the questions. Yeah, so what do you do with Glassdoor? How many people? know what their company's Glassdoor rating is. Okay. How many people know what Glassdoor is? It's been on the website for everybody's on the website. So interesting. Who knows? So basically, it's kind of like Yelp. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the easiest way to describe it is Yelp is you know, reviews for restaurants and reviews for hotels. It's just basically reviews for companies um, written by former employees or um, current employees. And people also
company probably has a profile and you might not even realize it does. Um, so, just, yeah, so what did you guys do with Slashdoor? How do you see it fitting into your branding strategy, if at all? Uh, you see, yeah, um, that goes back to the earlier part of the conversation that we had where for Glassdoor, let's think about the type of person, uh, I'm gonna bring it to the back to the customer. Let's think about the kind of person who uses Glassdoor. It's usually somebody going there for an interview. So they're looking to see, okay, let me see what this company is like. Now a lot of times when you look at the reviews, it's somebody say, oh, I interviewed here, whatever, whatever. So a lot of it has to do with what we said earlier making your interview process a pleasant um, process, you know, and that will get you certain reviews when you look at when people feel like, okay, yeah, they were really nice and respectful, yes, I can get the job, but based on what, you know, the feedback I got, it helps me. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the thing you need to, you find yourself looking at, looking at a good way from that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you just have to like, revamp your process from the, the inside out. You can't just deal with the fact there are bad reviews, but actually change your process to get the good reviews. Uh, anybody else? So we have a person um, in our company that manages uh, all the reviews on Glassdoor. She will respond to the negative and the positive. Positives are easy, that's great. I mean, she will respond to everybody. The negative, she handles a little bit more delicately. Um, you know, if we have escalates, whatever, she offers them to, you know, reach out to our compliance department, whatever, so on and so forth. Um, or she even volunteers, you know, contact me directly so on and so forth just to kind of mitigate it um but to your to your point earlier too and i think this is you know really for anybody that's recruiting in the company you're the first line from the outside in so that is critical that that first touch is critical like you whatever experience that first impression that they get i mean that's everything so um i actually got called on um canada had a really bad review with me and from that turning point, I mean, that just changed my whole thing. I'm like, no matter what, I mean, if I, words of tears talking to this person or, you know, whatever, it's going, I've had a bad day or whatever, it's, they're not going to be good. I have to make them have a great experience regardless, regardless if they're a perfect fit or not, so that they can always remember that and talk about it because that will mitigate, you know, or try to mitigate at least. But not only just me, either, guys, when they're coming in, and that's what I was saying to you about the hiring manager and, and the rest of my interview team, you got to coach them and teach them on best practices for interviewing. So whether it's, um, competency training or best behavior practices or um, unconscious bias. That's a new uh, thing that we're going to be training our, our team on too and stuff. So these candidates, I mean, word of mouth is huge. I won't go to a restaurant based on a bad Yelp, you know, review, so. Yeah, I know. I know it's a little different, but can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> does everybody, any, does anybody here know their company's interview process. Like, what are the steps? What are that goes into your interview process? Good. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. So, to point a question, kind of, is there a process? That, yeah. So, yeah. the point of yeah. that question is, it's very. A lot of companies treat their interview process, that first touch, very last. Yeah. Uh, um, from higher up all the way down, it's, you know, you want somebody, just, just get somebody. Yeah. And it's not a matter of, okay, we need to have a process. When people come in, how do they feel about our company? This is also part of our employer job. Um, and so you get a lot of people, even some of the hiring managers, not even knowing what the interview process is like. You get a resume, we hand it over to, say, for example, you're looking for a software engineer, we get a resume, we hand over a software engineer, we ask them a few questions, we call you back in two weeks if you, they like you or not. If you're not, just as we said earlier, you fall into a black hole and that's it. Mm -hmm. And that really, especially people with what we have now in social media, yes. that process now puts a lot of candidates who get that bad taste to go out and write those bad reviews or go out and say things or go out and spread that. And that's a part of managing your employer brand. Mm -hmm. And you guys are really focused on the Process and people writing reviews um, from the interview process. But what about like current employees who write reviews? Are people more leaving? Do you see that as like less, just less of a like a liability um, because they're already working or they probably have some brand affinity to your company? Or so I think it's 
treating it as, let's say, expectation of your stakeholders. How are we treating last door? Is it a gospel or is it Yelp or is it in the middle? I think it's in the middle. If you get a bad review, I'm not going to pull the fire alarm and say, hair on fire, we need to get something. Um, let's read the review, let's digest. Is it someone who just got let go? Was it someone in sales who was paying their numbers and they're disgruntled? Like, you know, but also, too, is, is there a trend? Is there one department that feels like they're underrepresented? You know, they feel like they're having a crappy experience. Is that one department leaving a lot of reviews? That's a different story. Um, bad reviews, I send a review to our HR business partner for that line of business, and I CC our chief people officer and our VP of HR. So that way, in case our CEO is like, hey, what's going on? The right people know that I'm on it. But also, too, the HR VPs are in tune to those lines of business more than I am. So they can say, oh, you know, something happened in Salesforce, and Salesforce isn't acting up, so salespeople are disgruntled that they can't make the leads in X, Y, and Z. You know, here's some tips on how to respond, uh, formally respond, I send it to the HRP, they finalize it, then we get it out. So it's also, so it's also like kind of meeting the expectation. You want me to sit on my store all day? Can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I was say, Drew, like, are you responsible for it? You are. I just want to hold it. Wow. Except for the negative and ones. How are you supposed to do all your other stuff? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's important because I think these reviews, they're important for obviously making sure like more and more people want to find your company, but then it does also help your business operations. I think maybe you're really listening to the trends, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, so um, speaking of listening, um, you also mentioned a lot about asking employees what they want their brands, so what they want the company's employer brand to look like. So you're kind of saying, like, ask them, like, what does that mean? Is that a focus group? Is that a survey? Do you use any particular survey platforms? to your company have a strategy behind that? Um, are you using Google Forms or SurveyMonkey? Just so if any of you can kind of share some tips depending on the size of your company or the folks are thinking about that. So we use MPS, so the net growth score. Um, it's a great way to tap into the department. You can see you know, how does engineering feel about you versus sales versus customer care versus you know, marketing. Um, we use survey monthly, survey monthly depending on what it is. Um, you know, we chase after the Boston Business Journal, best business in the world, the Boston Globe, top places in the world. Those are nice. Uh, those are nice um, kind of words to put on your resume. I mean, to put on your career site as well. Yeah. But um, I think that when you're starting out, it's great to take a pulse of how your company is this thing about you, rather than try to chase awards off of that. Mm -hmm. So you guys do survey monthly, you build your own survey. Yeah, it, it, it's way easier and cheaper to free mm -hmm. sort of menu, rather than other sources that will, hey, you know, take our survey, win an award, but we're going to charge you a bunch of money to see the results. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm using free, something free that you can say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else use anything like that? Or? Uh, Denver Grassroots constantly surveying their employees just to keep the temperature, make sure everybody's happy. Um, if there's something they're not happy about, we'll address it and fix it. So it's people. Um, we just got a new perk, uh, unsick day. Uh, which is now a new day off for our, um, and our included in our benefits, uh, which is basically a free day that you get paid for that you can use for doctor's appointments. Oh. So you don't have to. Oh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. So that you don't get sick. Exactly. That makes sense. Yeah. Same with us, actually. Like yeah. our benefits weren't reflecting. This is pre merger They weren't reflecting. Um, well, I mean, as we were growing, so we took a survey, people want like this, want this, we got pet insurance, we got, we got, you know, additional time off, things that reflect what people are saying rather than being like, oh, here are our benefits, deal with it, if not, those are so You really have to keep going, because as your company grows, uh, your employees grow, their needs change, mm -hmm. um, you know, child care, um, you know, things like that. Yeah. So at a previous company I worked at, it was a mid-stage startup, um, we all voted on what we thought the top four pillars of being a great staff member at this company were, and then we had this internal social media platform called Yammer, sort of like Facebook for work, and we would tag somebody if they were exhibiting one of the four pillars of values, like I saw someone go beyond with a customer, or I saw somebody pitch in at the last minute on a project with someone else, so you'd give them like a snap, it was like a snap hashtag, and then the value that they were exhibiting, and um, they'd be entered in a drawing every month, like the number of instances of snaps they got would put them in a randomized assortment for a free day off that they would just get, so they would have like a, a monthly team meeting where everyone would go through what they worked on, and like what the next goals were, and then at the end of it, they would randomize, pick somebody's hat, you know, I've had it. It's just really a nice little touch of like, 
encouraging people to actually live the values that your company has put together. So I thought that was really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah we do a similar thing at General Assembly. We call it GA, which is our acronym, and accolades. We just started doing it this year, so it's a quarterly contest. And so first step for something like that, though, is defining the values so that there's something specific that people are kind of voting on. Um, so, so some people might think that one thing is a really great work value, and somebody else might think something else is kind of all over the place. If you can define a core set of five, seven values, and then use that as the, the starting place for saying why someone's doing it. Um, so far, so good with our experience. <laughs> A lot of these things, it's also being consistent with it. You know, not just doing it one quarter and then forgetting that you did it the next, because people remember, you know, it's, you need to create those rituals, um, because otherwise people just think you're kind of all over the place. So there's nothing wrong with testing, but try to also ritualize some of these practices so that they don't just feel like you're kind of like throwing spaghetti on a wall, seeing which thing sticks. Um, so I think that's all the questions that we had that were prepared, but does anybody have any questions for, yeah? What would you say are your top three employee perks that allow you to see a direct result, like beer on Fridays, that should be number one, right? <laughs> so like number two or three, you guys can elaborate on that in terms of how employees are doing, whether it's cool enough to stay. To, to stay or to sign on, I suppose, depending on. Um, to sign on, but also to stay in that company. Mm -hmm. Say, I really enjoy working for this company versus another company. I'm not going to go I'm yeah. not going for another cooler company. Um, I would say, um, if you want to go flashy, like we have a half basketball court, mm -hmm. but I don't want people to join log me and just play basketball day or else you can get the work done. But that's one cool thing. I think another that you know, you're not going to put on a website is, um, from the CEO down, we're big on getting to know your employees. So the CEO knows my name, the executives, they know my name, your man, you know, drop down, like they get a, they make a point to know who your employees are. So even on your like crappiest day, hey Jason, how are you going? I found like, you know my name. It, 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 it's, it's the small thing, but I've been at companies where you only see the executive that earns earnings time. They're in their power suits, and they're going to the conference room, and they leave the conference room, and they're like, oh yeah, I saw this video that thing. That's, you know what I mean? So it's like nice when you work for a place where they know your name, um, and not good when nothing, something goes wrong when they know your name, but um, so that's two. I think the third is um, who you work with. You spend more time with your coworkers than you do like your own family. Sad to say, but it's true. So you just want to at least tolerate the people you work with. And if you can do that, it makes life and work much, you know, worth it, even through the good days and bad days. So we dismantled our annual reviews um, because we felt that nobody should be attached to a number for a year. Mm -hmm. How are you motivated to work with that? So what we've installed instead is priority setting. So you sit down on a quarterly basis with the manager and you discuss your top three priorities for that quarter. You're doing it, you've designed it, you're architecting it, and so the motivation and then the success factor that you accomplish these priorities, um, you know, it's just it's more impactful than being above average. So, yep. So, yeah, we have that external benefit. So, like, we have a great roof deck in Newbury Street, so we're in the heart of Back Bay. We allow dogs, we have a dog in our office. Normal. And then we have open vacation, and it's not like one of those like it's a trap open vacation policies. Like I'm going to Greece next week, so like it's a thing. Um, but the things that attracted me weren't the perks. I worked at two other startups. I'm used to the ping pong tables and all that. It was more like when I talked to the CEO and the CTO, they really were invested in hiring great people. They were really enthused about the mission and the product. They asked really great questions about my background, not just my experience and my skills, but what was I interested at in outside of work. I thought that was really interesting. Like they wanted to know me and not just me as a candidate. Um, I think the last thing is they said they really wanted to build the company thoughtfully and they really wanted to make really thoughtful investments in the, the people. And so, you know, we're really small now, it's easy to say that, but I really do truly really believe that they believe that. And it's just great to have an environment where everyone's kind of working towards a mission and we're all giving each other high fives. I would say that three things are uh, office space, food, and cafe. <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, most people, when they walk into the office and they see how the office space looks, um, whether it's open 
mainly open space now, which everybody's going to. So that for collaboration, people love to see that. And most places, most people will stay there because they're able to collaborate easily with their teams. Um, food is, I know people will laugh about food, but when you're working late or you get there early um, and your place has a coffee machine or has actually a whole barista there yeah. or has snacks in the daytime or dinner you can pick up uh, when you're working late, that lets a lot of people stay because they realize, hey, this helps out so much in healthcare because if you go, know, if you've ever been without a job or your job is good enough to your plan, you definitely don't lie. You will not leave because of healthcare. Yeah. And speaking of growing with your, your employees, so with my experience, I've been at, at General Assembly, which is a, was an early stage startup, now not so much for four years. So I've really stayed. So I'm like the poster child <laughs> and somebody who stayed at a company. Um, and one thing that helped me was they grew with their employee base um, by offering a maternity leave plan that was just a notch better than any other plan I had heard about. <coughs> So it's not hard to just go a little bit above and beyond. You don't have to say, oh, like you don't have to work for a year. But instead of doing 12-week policy, do the four-month policy. Um, and just kind of go like a little above and beyond the things that you can go on, above and beyond on, just to really seal the deal and make somebody feel like you care about them. Right. Um, and it just goes a long way. So it doesn't have to be eternity. For my my case, that was why I'm, you know, I came back on loyal, like, you know, I was just like so like pleased with what they offered. Um, but define what those things are that you can do at your company that just make people feel like you're really investing in them. Because it doesn't have to be a huge thing on your end, but it might feel huge to you know, employee. Like unlimited education is another one. People aren't going to take advantage of that. Not if you're hiring the right people, but, but offering it is huge. So, um, so uh, we work with tech companies with their, uh, their real estate and office space. And I know that's we sort of uh, raised here a bit, and uh, Jared and mentioned sort of everyone's going towards this open sort of collaborative plan. I guess kind of two questions. One is um, when everyone's doing that one thing uh, and everyone's going towards an open plan, like less private offices, more open space, lower cubes, how do you differentiate yourself against your competitors? And do you think you can go too far with that and sort of give up sort of the individualism for collaboration? So we have small huddle rooms for all our offices, and so if you need to have a private conversation, or there are times when I throw my headphones and get work done, I can go in a little huddle room, or you know, I can go into the cat, or you know, I, like, I can leave my desk, but feel like I have some privacy. It's not just this one big room that it's in the center of people walking around me. So we're blessed enough to have enough space uh, in the open seaport where I can move around and feel like, or if it's a nice day, I'll go on the patio, I'll go on the roof deck, and you know, kind of have some space. Not everyone has that, so it kind of teaches their own. In terms of going too far, I don't know, maybe I have a slide. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, but um, it, it's tough. Because some people like open office, cubes, you get sick easily, there's not enough collaboration. So there's, there's constantly both sides. You know, it's like, it's like Pepsi. Uh, it's like Coke and Pepsi, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know, maybe if there's a happy medium, one cubicle, I don't know. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's, <laughs> there's a way you can, uh, yes, yeah, there's some parts you can go too far. I've worked at a, a, a tech company um, and one of the problems that we had was the area where people came and either had lunch or watched TV was like right near a lot of desks. So come Friday evening when one department was off, you hear a whole a whole roar of noise coming in and a lot of people are still trying to work. So there is that issue. But um, as Jesse said, Different companies design different things around the office that, that differentiates you. Whether it is a home booth, whether it is, I've got a work company we had phone booths. Yeah. So you can go into a phone booth and have your conversation. Um, they have quiet areas that you can go around in. Right around there, it's quiet. Um, so it really depends on how you just how those companies design it um, to have to basically conduct certain business and facilitate you know, be productive. And that's another thing is we, so we just went through a move of going from a space 
space that we were in a co-working space and we had our classrooms separated. So we just had offices upstairs in a co-working space. We didn't have to deal with a lot of like, making coffee. So like kind of owning our own space as a group of a uh, team of 15 people. And we had to define office rules that we had never had to do before. And so you also have to just not be afraid of like, you've set up different constraints. Like you can't control your space 100%. Like maybe there's always going to be cubes. But you can come up with some goals and guidelines for your community um, that really help make the space work. Um, so it's not always just kind of like knocking down a bunch of walls. Um, maybe you say like, once a day we all get together and you know, we're talking about what we're, we're working on so that we're chatting with each other even if we do have these all in different offices, whatever. Actually, at my last job, we would swap desk arrangements yep. every That's four months That's just idea. so that like teams that didn't really talk to each other could collaborate. And sometimes it's great to have like customer success next to marketing or sales next to engineering. So it just kind of fostered conversations that might not have happened otherwise. We should. <laughs> Sorry, there's no to team oh, yeah. <laughs> We should do that. Um, yeah. Um, do you currently like sponsor events? Do you see that? Uh, that's something that I am actually looking to do. That's one of my priorities. Um, just to bring, like, yeah, the outside in. I think um, Mass TLC did something to uh, last month about the new co, where you guys mm -hmm. had like the office tours, which is something that we wanted to participate in and stuff. But um, so that's a double-edged sword, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So it allows company, you know, allows individuals to come in, um, maybe sit in on a meetup or whatever that's being sponsored. But at the same time, too, it's like. Um, our internal employees will maybe also go to that meetup and maybe try to get recruited out. So it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, delicate line. Um, trying to figure out how to manage that. Yeah. So I have a goal of having I we host I host three events a month. So I actually never have an issue with people like coming down. If anything, they come down for the free food and then they leave. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as they're not taking your employees. Well, exactly. Again, that's yeah. food, right? Yeah. But but like they were under but this past weekend, it was like Friday night and all day Saturday, Saturday we host a rails bridge. Okay. So rails bridge, you know, they have poets coming in, they teach them movie and movie on rails. Um, and I got them the free food. Um, <laughs> but no, but, but it's cool because people who are interested in tech, they can come see what a tech company looks like. And they can meet a friendly face and kind of say, oh, it's so really cool. I can imagine myself uh, in a space like this one day. And so um, it's not just me, like all of our, all of our whether the engineering, marketing, sales, uh, we're all as Well, us as a tech connection, uh, we actually run a meetup called the Black Boston Tech, tech Boston Meetup, where we go to different tech companies. We've been to Google, Wistia, Twitter, and we have where the staff comes and speaks to group of people about the company uh, so that people get to see what it is like to be within that company. Um, and we get tours of the office and stuff like that. So we do things like that every quarter for different companies um, across Boston. Um, <laughs> so what are we talking about? What's the name of your meetup group? Black uh, Boston. Black Boston? Black uh, Boston. Black Boston? Black Boston? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we usually go to tech companies. Um, where the list, it was really good because they had a whole video and their CEO came down and actually grabbed the meetup. And we had people who were there from the side employees give personal tours and actually show where the desk was. Um, and we do that every quarter for different companies. Uh, so people get to see within these companies and that's another part of their employee branding. So they get to see exactly what it is to work there. Um, and then we also host, we're also a uh, premier host for a conference that's happening um, in May 22nd at the Seaport uh, called the Inclusive Innovation Leadership Conference where we're going to have, where there's going to be different speakers happening there. Um, different CEOs are going to talk about their culture building, and employee branding, and what they're doing, whether they have that person inside or just building a uh, culture uh, there. So we, we take part in all of those kind of programs and we help to promote those programs out there. We'll send that out in the fall, you know, that actually looks good, yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, speaking of culture, um, I know a lot of an employee's success is fitting into the corporate culture. How do you manage what a company wants to project in marketing versus having that genuineness that comes across in the recruiting effort, in the, um, in the interview effort, to make sure that there's a good understanding on both parts 
of what's really genuinely going to be the environment versus what the company wants to project. I can take a step at that. Um, I think the answer to that is making sure that you um, you have your values are defined in the mission statement. So for John Bradstreet, we have three core values. You have to be data inspired, inherently generous, and relentlessly curious. And if you embody those three pieces, you're going to fit in just great. Um, we also, you know, for a industrial company, we're very entrepreneurial. Um, so I, I, you know, just the conversations that I have with the candidates and stuff, I want to know what your drive is, what your passion is, what makes them tick. And then that kind of gives me a good indication of whether or not they're going to fit in with us. But primarily, just being data inspired that's so curious, inherently generous. It's your ticket. And sometimes uh, your company not, may not be right for that candidate. When I used to recruit, I've had those conversations. Like, based on what you're telling, what you want, we can't offer you this. I wish you the best. Let me know I can do your research to you. So it's being honest, too. Yeah. But what do you do with the people that are internal to your company to make sure that what they're projecting is genuine? Providing a positive experience, so listening to them with you know surveys and, and benefits that, that matter to them. It's you know um, you know if you're providing opportunity, if they feel appreciated, you know those two there go a long way. You know, hey, good job today. You know, I appreciate your help. Like saying thank you. You know, small things. It, you know, it goes a long way. I've been at companies where within the recruiting team, they're just constantly butting heads. You know, you can't get work done. You, have, you send an email, it, it, it gives like a snarky response. I'm like, That's, I don't want to be there, so yeah. I'm going to leave. So just treating people the way you want to be treated goes a long way with your employees speaking long with your company. Your company's like a small town. You don't have disgruntled townies who are like, I don't like this, I don't like that. It's going to happen. You can't please everyone. But if you treat people the way you want to be treated, I have a two-fold question. And the, they're both kind of rooted in the fact that most of your relationships with your recruits start well before you guys ever have had contact with them, right? So what do you want your company to do to project what brings you the best candidate, right? Well, what should your company be doing before you ever talk to them? And then on the other side of that, what is it that your company does that totally gets in your way? Referrals. Um, if you have a lot of referrals, that shows that your employees are engaged. If you don't, figure out why are we not getting referrals? What about it? You know, what like, what, what about the company? Um, can we change so we get referrals? Are your top source of staff, as they should be, or your top source of hires? You know, it's easier. Like when I would recruit, I would say. Think about growing up with kickball. Do you want to play kickball with a person that your friend knows or some Joe Schnall? I want a play that comes highly recommended. So referrals, I think, is, is, is the best way to kind of gauge that. And then something that gets in the way, for me right now, it's a process. You know, I'm, I'm used to be able to go, 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 and now it's like someone else actually had thought about this, and I'm like, yeah, you're probably right, and I should probably do that, but I just want to go. So it's kind of attaining my expectations, knowing that I can't run as fast as I want to, for good reason. But. Um, I went to Indeed Interactive last year, and one of the things that they talked about was the application process, the online application process. And if it's like, if you get up to like X amount of questions, your candidate pool will drop off. Um, and the number one like company that has like the least amount of questions was Netflix, I think it was five. <laughs> Name, address, Title, job you're applying for, why, boom. That was the application process. It was wonderful. Um, but if it's like more than you know, 10 steps, that's, that's what gets in the way sometimes. Yeah, but what about experience? I mean, I'll be honest about experience. Well, there's always a follow-up and stuff too, but just like make it a smoother process, right? Get it. Yeah. I was reading this really interesting article on LinkedIn, and it was like an influencer in the hiring space, and he said that a lot of companies make a mistake of assuming that there's a surplus in the marketplace of candidates, but it's really a scarcity and so companies that just reactively post a job when it's like almost too late and they need yes. it two weeks from now and they're just accepting whoever comes along and like okay if they're within this one month window then I guess we're just gonna have to pick one you know versus like filling your candidate pipeline ahead of time with people that you find on LinkedIn or you're impressed by them 
uh, you know, doing a side hustle or something where they've gotten your attention or you found them and you're building a relationship proactively so that when the time comes to hire, you know who your top 50 people would be to reach out to and you're not just some random recruiter off the street who's trying to in-mail them at the last minute and they're like, oh no, not again, you know? Yeah. So that's something I think a lot of people make a mistake about. Students as a last question. So, uh, question in terms of working with internal recruiters. Um, do you see them as part of your brand? And with that, do you see it as a possible damaging part? I've seen many examples where I've reached out to a candidate and said, Yeah, I've talked to seven other recruiters. I think sounds horrible. When they may not know the real story, do you narrow your recruiting partners based upon the message that they can carry, the message you want carried? How do you partner with external people to carry that brand? So, Sounds like you have a thought. <laughs> oh, I'm just saying, we, so we recently hired um, a couple of people, a very small nonprofit. Um, and we don't we have to look to external recruiters to do that for us. I was hired through them. I didn't have a good experience. Everyone who's come through them hasn't had a good experience, but we haven't changed. So that is something that we're It's interesting, because I'll offer here, we have 100 partners. We're pairing it down to five. Could you get to 100 <laughs> And how can you control that message with 100 people? Yeah. What's your take on that? So, so um, Tech Connection is, you would say we will be, our, we would be that external partner sure. for many companies. And what we do, we, we are what we call recruiting concierge service. So we actually have someone dedicated to a partner. Um, and that person has to carry the event. You know we're your first point of contact. So what do we do is work alongside hiring managers a lot to get that message and to kind of feel what we, to kind of feel as if you're actually talking to someone inside of the company. And I think that's where, as we, I think we initially started with the conversation is that most recruiters or even, HR, or even hiring managers, it's kind of like, just hire somebody, they don't care to give you a resume, and it's not a matter of giving them an experience. Um, and that's what we definitely try to build, and that's what, when you're working with an external partner, we believe that's what you should try to build, is get them within your company. You should be a consultant that's working with you, working with your team, and kind of embodying your HR team. So we bring them on site, and so say it's like, Three. They come on site and we give them a tour as if they're a candidate. You know, here's how you come in, here's the experience, here's some amenities that a candidate will see. It's that way, like when I pitch the job, they kind of visualize, hey, here's what you'll see. Here's how, here's what I, I saw certain people interacting. I saw, you know, open meetings and blah, blah, blah. And also it's connecting, it's like, when I was recruited to be the agency, meeting the hiring manager on a call. Mm -hmm. So that way, we're all connected, we all share, we're all on the same page as like, What's the hiring expectation? What are mine and what are the agents? So that way there's, you know, it's not just me playing telephone, right? Mm -hmm. cool. Well, I want to let everybody have a chance to connect individually in case you have follow-up questions. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention.